How serious is the sin of women preachers, women pastors? Now, I do think that that is a sin. I do think that is clearly counter to the teaching of the scriptures. But the question is, how serious of a matter is that? Is it worth leaving your church? Is it worth leaving your denomination? Is that something that you should feel a particular crunch of your conscience about if, in fact, your church does have female preachers or if your denomination has female pastors? Where can we assign that in terms of level of gradation of the seriousness of that particular error? Well, we're going to talk about that in this video. Thanks for checking into this channel. My name is Matthew. I'm one of the pastors here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church like that, please come check us out, Gospel Fellowship PCA. We'd be glad to have you. All right, now before we get into that topic, I do want to really quickly just make a commercial announcement here for my book. It just came out in audible form. Now, this book has been out for some time. This is my magnum opus, I suppose, A Theology of Joy, Jonathan Edwards, and Eternal Happiness in the Holy Trinity. The book has been out for some time, but now it's out in audible form. So if you have a long drive coming up, if you like to listen to books while you run or while you work out, please check this out. If you have already got this book, please give me a nice little review on Amazon that does help and thank you so much for considering that. Now, here's the reason that I'm bringing this particular topic about women preachers up today. It's kind of water under the bridge as far as my own personal history goes, but I do want to give you some background. Okay, so when I was originally ordained, um, I came into the denomination called the EPC, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. It is not the denomination that I'm in today. Today, I'm in a uh, slightly more conservative expression of Presbyterianism called the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America. Okay, so I was originally in the EPC when I was in Florida for 11 years. My church, Faith Church, was part of the EPC, and it was part of the Presbytery of Florida. Now, just so you know the background here, Faith Church, my church, was a complementarian church, which means that it only had male pastors and male elders. And we held that by way of conviction. We think that that's what the scriptures teach on that matter. And at the time that I was received into the Presbytery of Florida, the Presbytery itself was one of a few left EPC Presbyteries that were complementarian. We did not have female pastors, okay? Now, something changed during the time that I was there. We actually received a church into our body from the mainline denomination, the PCUSA, that had female pastors. And we, in error, in my opinion, received that church into the Presbytery of Florida and also received their female pastors. I thought that was a mistake at the time. I spoke out ardently against it at the time. I was outspoken on this topic, and I tried the best I could do to retain our complementarianism, but alas, I failed in that endeavor. Now, again, that's all water under the bridge as far as that goes, because I'm in the PCA now, and we are a complementarian denomination. We have only male pastors and male elders and male deacons. But something happened recently that brought this all back to the fore. Um, I posted a video a couple of days ago now about the mainline denomination. And of course, because I talked about sexual ethics and sexual immorality in that video, it was a controversial video. People liked it. Some people didn't like it. Some people attacked me for the things I say. Fair enough. It's the internet. What can you do, right? But one particular person said some things about me that got a little bit personal. Now, before I show you the tweet here, I want you to know the goodness of the gospel. These tweets have been taken down. The person apologized. Forgiveness has been extended. So there is no personal animus between me and the person who tweeted these things. Okay. So as far as I'm I'm concerned. It's all good to go. But the point, though, I did want to address here because it's serious enough to want to make uh, some kind of a, a disclaimer here. So the person says, to now somehow claim that your team, I think the tweeter here is referring to the PCA, is the true torchbearer after you yourself were ordained in a denomination, which you have no problem calling heretics. Now, this is the language that triggers me to want to make this video. Less than a year after leaving says, one, either you yourself are possibly heretical, two, pot, meat, kettle, in other words, I'm a hypocrite, or three, you are a betrayer, okay? So it's the language of heresy here that, um, that makes me want to give some explanation here. Now again, all personal forgiveness, all reconciliation, no problem. But if I ever said that the EPC was heretical, then I should certainly apologize for that. I don't believe I said that. And the reason is because I have kind of a well-formed view, I think, of what 
categories there are in terms of false teaching within the church. So let me show you these categories that I work from. This is a helpful rubric for me, and maybe this might be helpful for you. And then at the end of the video, we're going to try to assign where I think female preachers falls in the in this category, this spectrum, let's say, this continuum of false teaching. So we have error, we have false teaching, we have heresy, we have blasphemy, denial, slash apostasy, or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now let me try to give a definition of each one of these. First, let's talk about error. Error is the least damaging of all of these things because for all practical purposes, it's unintentional and it has very little consequences, okay? So what I mean by that is something like this. Suppose you're preaching a sermon and you're preaching on one text and you refer to Matthew, but you meant to say Mark or you meant to say Luke. And in fact, it's actually the passage that you're referring to in Luke or Mark and not Matthew. You said it, but it was wrong. Now, it's not according to fact. It's not a true statement. So it is, in fact, an error. Now, the chances of that having deleterious effects on the spiritual health of your congregation are very small. We all make imprecisions in our speech all the time. Okay, so an error would be simply a factually incorrect statement. It could be a little bit more serious than that. Let's say we were discussing discussing the author of the book of Hebrews. Maybe you have a very strong uh, conviction that it's Paul or Apollos or Luke, and you argue for that. It turns out you're wrong at the end of the day. Uh, it was the other guy. Well, that would still be an error on your part, even if it was something of a learned error. But still, the relative consequences of that having any sort of deleterious effect on, on the church is probably probably pretty small. Okay, so some mistakes are relatively harmless as far as that goes. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't correct them. It doesn't mean that we couldn't apologize if we made an error. But most of the time, it's uh, sort of no harm, no foul. If you know what I'm saying, errors don't have a lot of negative consequences on one's spiritual well-being, though they could, okay, they could. Remember, this is all a continuum and the lines are blurred sometimes. Now, next, there is a category of false teaching that is more serious than an error, okay? False teaching is when you're teaching something that is not in accord with the truth and you're doing so rather willfully and perhaps even, uh, even intentionally on your part. So let me give you an example, and some of you are going to get a little uncomfortable with this because I'm going I'm, I'm to pick an example that probably makes you, you know, sweat a little bit. When it comes to baptism, I believe that infants should be baptized, baptized. Maybe you don't, but one of us is wrong there, okay? Either the claim is true that infants ought to be baptized, the infants of believing members of the church, or they shouldn't, but we can't both be right there. So one of us is, is going to be wrong in that regard. Same thing true with, with a lot of other things. So for instance, I believe in Presbyterianism that churches have uh, should have a plurality of elders and should be connected with some sort of relationship between churches. Maybe you're in an independent model where there's a senior pastor and that's it. There is no fellowship with other uh, churches. Well, again, I'm going to argue from scripture that I'm right and you're wrong, but you might argue equally forcefully the other direction. But one of us is in fact actually wrong and is teaching something that is contrary to the sound teachings of scripture. So false teaching is clearly more serious than error, but it can still get more serious yet. So for instance, the category of heresy. Now notice as the color darkens here, the seriousness of the degree of the sin intensifies. Heresy would be a particular kind of false teaching in which core Christian doctrines are assailed or attacked. So under heresy, we're talking about um, like anti-Trinitarian heresies or uh, a disagreement in Christology that strikes to the very vitals of who Jesus is. So, for instance, the Nestorian error or the Arian error, those things are heresy because they're really, really serious. And in fact, they undercut the power and the goodness of God and the gospel. Okay, so if you denied the resurrection of Jesus or something like that, or the inspiration of scripture, then you would definitely be con uh, you'd be committing the error of heresy, a very serious sin, but it can still get worse. There is blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is the mockery, the scorn, the hatred, the belittling of the very character of God himself. So if you were to speak against God, if you were to say something derisive or hateful against God, you would be, considering, you would be committing the sin of blasphemy, which is even worse than heresy. And then it gets more serious yet with denial and apostasy. Now, these are typically the sins of a person who once professed faith, but then departs from that faith and says things on the way out the door 
that uh, belittle, mock, besmirch Christ or the church. Very, very damaging kind of error here, of course. So Peter, when he denied three times the Lord Jesus, he said, I didn't even know him. Now, we are so serious at this point that we're talking about just grave and reprehensible mistakes here, sins, trespasses, iniquities, transgressions, very, very serious here. And yet there is one more category, even more serious, and that would be blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This is the one sin that the Bible says is unforgivable. Now, all of the others, the first five, can be forgiven and corrected because of grace, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is one's final, complete, and total rejection of the grace. In fact, even attributing the grace of the Holy Spirit to the demonic work of Satan himself. That's how hardened it is, and there is no possibility of forgiveness for those who've committed that sin. Okay, so the question that we want to discuss then is um, how serious is the sin of female pastors or female teaching elders or female preachers? Well, um, it's definitely more hardened than an error, I believe, for sure, because a lot of people make pretty end around type of biblical arguments that in my view obfuscate or get around or do an end run around the Bible's clearest teaching on this particular topic. Okay, so it's not like they just made a mistake and they didn't see passages like 1 Corinthians 14 or 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, maybe they totally botched Galatians 3.28 for there's no longer male or female, Jew or Gentile, you're all one in Christ Jesus, etc. Maybe they intentionally botched it. Um, it's certainly to me worse than an error, which is a simple mistake, but it also doesn't quite rise to the level of heresy because I do think that a church that is egalitarian can still be faithful to the basic core essential teaching of the gospel, like the Trinity, like the atonement of Jesus, like the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, affirming his victorious return and things like that, okay? So I don't think it's heresy, and if I ever said that the EPC was heretical for having female pastors, then I would certainly apologize for that. I don't believe I said that, though. I do think it is a serious error. Okay, so I don't think it rises to the level of blasphemy, denial, or blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So in my view, the best place that we could put the mistake of teaching uh, female pastors or female preachers is false teaching. Now, that's a serious category. I'm not, I'm not diminishing the seriousness of this. In fact, for me, it was so serious that I wanted to change denominations. And you might want to consider that as well. If you're in a denomination that has female pastors or female preachers, and that is very, very counter to the clear teaching of the Word of God, then, then you might want to consider the seriousness of, seriousness of that matter. Moreover, and more to that same point, one of the reasons why this is a particularly serious form of false teaching, uh, besides the fact that it overtly contradicts the direct and express teaching of the Bible on this matter, is that this kind of uh, false teaching does tend to be the slippery slope, which leads to all kinds of other things. Now, whether or not the slippery slope argument is an informal fallacy, I suppose we could talk about that later, but it certainly does seem to be a real thing that whenever a denomination begins to affirm female preachers and teachers, they have to do a lot of end around type exegesis to get around the clear teaching of scripture on this matter. And that usually leads leads to more and more serious sins and compromises, as we have seen so many times in so many other den other denominations. Um, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, the PCUSA, the United Church of Christ, the Methodist Church. Once a church begins to ignore the Bible's clear teaching about sexuality and gender, it tends to tumble down the hill of all kinds of other errors. And that's where they do then very often slip into errors like heresy and blasphemy and even worse sins. So although relatively speaking, I think that this is somewhere between error and heresy, namely probably the best fitting category is false teaching. I do think in my view that this particular sin is serious enough that you should reconsider whether or not you would participate in a church or denomination that has female pastors. Okay, well, that's it for me. Hopefully that cleared up a little bit about that person's tweet, maybe explained a little bit of the background. Again, all forgiveness as far as me and the tweeter go, so that's all great. But I did want to address the topic of female pastors because it is something that I think um, 
gets pretty serious pretty quickly. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. Again, don't forget my book uh, on joy is now available on Audible. Please grab that in the description below. If you could hit me up with a nice review on Amazon, that would be great too. Thanks for checking in. Do love you lots. Talk to you later.